Okay, uh, ooh, it's on. Good morning all, uh, and thank you very much for being here. I see uh, some familiar faces and some not familiar faces, but I'm really happy you, you, you chose to come along. I know there's a lot of choice uh, in this um, conference, so thank you for attending. Um, and what we're trying to do today is to try and explore what we can learn from looking across a high, low and middle income settings when we're trying to understand how pay for performance works. Um, a few years ago I was invited by uh, colleagues in this project here called PEMPA, Performance Based Financing Mechanisms for Health System Strengthening in Africa to collaborate with them um, uh, on a project that was trying to understand the impact of paper performance on the quality of maternity care in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Now, I had personally only worked in a high income setting myself, and when I looked at this literature here that we were looking at for the project, I was surprised to find that I didn't really recognize any of the papers that were being cited, and often I also didn't realize, uh, recognize the hypothesis that were being stated. So I, I think uh, from, from my perspective, well, we, we, we shouldn't go into that too much, but uh, it seemed that we had different expectations about whether pay for performance would work and how it would work. Um, and, and, and initially I had this surprise about why, why are these, uh, this literature not citing the literature I know? But of course, it only took a little bit of work with my co-authors and some reflection to realize that the reverse was also true. When we were doing the high-income pay-for-performance papers, we also didn't really, at least I, I admit I was guilty of that, uh, consider the vast amount of literature that there exists from uh, low- and middle-income countries, uh, especially there's many RCTs that has looked at, at pay-for-performance, and so the question is, wh why is that? And is there anything we can do to, um, yeah, to, to, to make up for that? Isn't there something we can learn when we're all trying to understand whether this is an effective way of paying for uh, health care and also trying to understand what is it, what are the mechanisms that, that might make uh, pay for performance work or not work? So together with the colleagues from this project, um, we had a, a workshop in Liverpool in October last year with a really interesting day of discussions uh, with presentations from both uh, researchers working on high income countries and low and middle income countries. Uh, and although I'm not really sure we reached any conclusion about why um, there isn't more dialogue, at least we all agreed that, 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 that there should be. And so I guess that's what we're trying to do today, um, to try and understand what, I, what is the scope for, the facilitators of, and the barriers to learning from across income settings in research uh, on high and middle income countries. Um, so I'm really grateful uh, today that we can uh, have three uh, great speakers helping us uh, delving a bit more into that uh, topic. Uh, and we begin with a, a presentation by uh, Fatima Mustafa, who you'll see in a minute. Uh, Fatima is a health specialist with the Health, Nutrition and Population Global Practice at the World Bank Group based in Nigeria. Uh, she received her MSc in Health Policy Planning and Finance from the LSE in 2010. And she's a seasoned health specialist with extensive experience in performance-based financing. And she's going to speak to us today about uh, a performance-based financing versus decentralized facility financing in Nigeria. So that'll be the first presentation. In fact, we'll speak for about 20 minutes about that. Uh, then I will take very few clarifying questions, but I'm not going to open a big uh, dialogue at that point. Uh, because uh, after Fatima, I'll invite uh, Meredith Rosenthal to speak to us about financial incentives to physicians patients, or both, to improve lipid management. Uh, Meredith is the C. Boyden Gray Professor of Health Economics and Policy at the Harvard C.H. Chan School of Public Health and a faculty chair of Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative. Um, she received her PhD in health policy at Harvard in 1998, and as you will see, her research examines 
the design and impact of market-oriented health policy mechanisms with a particular focus on the use of financial incentives to alter consumer and provider behavior. And once Meredith has spoken, uh, we will then invite uh, Peter Smith to try and get us to reflect on how these two literatures can speak uh, more together. So Peter is an Emeritus Professor of Health Policy at Imperial College London and a Professor of Global Health Economics at the University of York. His main research interests are in the finance and efficiency of health systems with a special emphasis on the link between research evidence and policy. And so uh, once we've had the two presentations, Peter is going uh, to, to help us reflect and then please I really rely on all of you to participate in the, uh, in, the, in the discussion at the end. So, I'm going to uh, stop talking now, and I will invi invite uh, Fatima uh, to give her uh, first presentation. Good morning, colleagues. Um, 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 here to present um, results from the first, I would say, pay for performance initiative in Nigeria. And I would um, share the, some background information with you as to why the numbers behind the midline impact evaluation. So, um, to start with, um, Healthcare indicators, both for maternal and child health care, have been um, really poor in, in Nigeria for the past two to three decades. There hasn't been significant improvement in that. And so the idea of perhaps um, a reform or policy that would incentivize healthcare workers to actually uh, um, work uh, it towards improving the outcomes of indicators of interest uh, was the reason behind the introduction of uh, performance-based finance in Nigeria, result-based finance in Nigeria. Piloted first in 2011 in three districts across three states. Uh, it was World Bank supported. Uh, there was a pre-pilot uh, design and implementation for scale up were adjusted based on um, um, based on experience and also uh, lessons learned from the pre-pilot stage. Uh, there were encouraging results, but then uh, the design was a bit uh, different from the pre-pilot to the pilot state across three streets. We have three intervention states and three control states um, and uh, there are two intervention arms to the program. One is the performance-based financing, where there is a cash incentive associated to improve the outcomes both in quality and quantity of care to healthcare workers, while we have the decentralized financing facility where um, funds are just uh, given to healthcare, oh, sorry, health facility manage, managers to run their businesses run facilities as, as business uh, uh, to, to, to improve maternal and child health care. There are specific um, indicators of interest, but then I would start with uh, the main differences between the two interventions. There are a bit similar in that they're both uh, randomly assigned, both uh, the states and also the control, but also at the state level, the local governments are randomly chosen either as PBF or DFF facilities. Both in both arms have um, to have a bank account and also relative autonomy. There is a lump uh, sum um, investment unit given to both arms at the start of, the, of their contract. But then attached to all of that is that uh, there is a disbursement linked indicator at the state level where the states are incentivized for improvement in the indicators of maternal and child health care. Provider payment, we have a quality adjusted perspective for the P 
PBF, but then in the case of the DFF, it is capitated to the, that of um, the PBF. So 50% is what the 50% of what um, DFF earns, 50% of what PBF uh, health facilities eventually earn at the end of every quarter. And provider in income is up to 50%. So in PBF, PBF facilities get uh, up to 50% of their income as incentive that can be shared across all uh, healthcare workers in the facilities, while that's not the case in DFF. <coughs> As I've stated earlier, there are similarities and differences, but then uh, there's, there's some, there are some overarching um, uh, frameworks across all uh, intervention arms, both DFF and PBF, that's the DLI earned at state level, so state healthcare uh, officials are incentivized to encourage healthcare workers at the facility level to ensure that uh, outcomes of, uh, of indicators improve over time. And uh, that's not just within the project, uh, Nigeria State Health Investment, but we also have the Saving One Million Lives is uh, across the whole country that incentivizes similar indicators of maternal and child health care. Key differences are that the provider payment mechanisms are different. For PBF, we have a quality adjusted uh, prospective pay, uh, provider payment mechanism, while DFF is capitated to that of uh, PBF, 50%. The use of decentralized funding is also different, where PBF uses about 50% of their income for performance, while DFF could not, could not use their income for incentive to healthcare workers, but then they are allowed to contract uh, uh, staff to help them deliver on their mandates. So design and lessons learned from that that there was clear uh, improvement in separation of functions and also contracting out to non-state actors was also for the verification, contract management, and also verification of results, which is also a, 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 an autonomy introduced to, to the system by the project. Uh, there, was an, there is enhanced information and communica uh, communication technology where tablets and smartphones are used to collect data and upload them on the open portal for easy access. Uh, the, in, the, the information from project level is also linked to the central uh, national health management information system, but also there was improvement in data use, uh, data collection used across board, so both at the PAC level, but also at the facility and state level. Summary from the midterm results. So with this result I'm presenting is from the impact evaluation of the project at Midline. There is remarkable change in service delivery in terms of new and improved structures, but also availability of drugs and also healthcare workers, and reduction in cost service, uh, making facilities more attractive to clients than otherwise. And this um, saying is that um, it's compared to the control arm of the project because we have control states that do not have any of the two intervention at all. Secondly, there are changes along the way with a new paradigm of management intervention, which has enhanced capacity, both ability and also disposition to work at, uh, of healthcare workers. But then there are challenges in improving geographical and financial access, as well as bringing about behavioral change for adopting modern methods of uh, healthcare delivery especially, uh, sorry, modern methods of healthcare services, especially family planning. There are gaps in financial flow and also perceptions regarding attitudes of healthcare workers among community members. And there is a mismatch of expectation from verification process by the health providers. Uh, 
The narratives from the qualitative study also suggest minor qualitative difference across PBF and DFF, uh, such that PBF facilities are uh, better able to provide demand side uh, in incentives due to the grants received to communities to use for service, while financial hardship reportedly were more deliberating among communities served by DFF. Another finding from the qualitative research is that many healthcare providers working in DFF facilities wanted to transition to PBF and they've been given the impression at the start of the program that should they perform well, they, there is a chance for them to be in the intervention arm of the PBF. So the methodology of the impact evaluation here. So it, at, there was adjustment for difference in difference, and uh, what's it, what, what was looked at is endship versus control. Control is business as usual, there's no intervention at all, either decentralized facility financing or PBF at all. And then we looked at PBF versus control, and then we also compared PBF and DFF. There was a lack of parallel tre trend for A to 22 household facilities, including skilled birth attendants, but also one where control states became worse off than the um, intervention states. Adjustments in difference, in difference estimates uh, factored in much enumeration and also the use of probability to reweight the difference in difference regression. Just to give you an idea of the interventions where in Nigeria we have the, pro the intervention states marked as end ship and then the control as control here. And uh, control states were chosen or matched based on the similarities in uh, Health, maternal and child health indicators from the DHS. Baseline data was collected in 2014, while midline was uh, conducted in 2017. Same health facilities were surveyed for the midline. However, the households, different households, but the same villages were uh, randomly selected for the midline compared to the baseline. Indicators identified at the concept note of the midline are this, um, focusing on maternal and child health. So uh, fully immunized children, skilled birth attendants, and contraceptive, amongst others. Key results from the project uh, at midline, um, you would see that um, there is significant difference there is no significant difference between the two intervention um, across all indicators, and I would go into details as to why, what are the contextual factors, what are the driving factors to, as to why there were not as much significant difference between the two intervention arms. But then there is a significant difference between the whole of the project versus the control sites. But this was uh, where I was saying there wasn't a significant difference between the two intervention sites as much as compared to the first one where we were uh, comparing the project or the intervention to control. And uh, I would go through this slides quickly, but then I'll come and um, respond to the numbers um, back. And so who benefits from NSHIP? Uh, there are children and also mothers because that the target of the project is to improve maternal and child health services. To summarize the key findings from the numbers I projected earlier is that the project saw improvement in most outcomes relative to business as usual, which is a control site where there's no intervention at all. But then in the PBF uh, intervention, uh, we saw increased institutional deliveries more than that of the PBF. As a percentage change, impact is larger than that of Rwanda. And I'll go back to show you the numbers. 
But then on the other side, DFF as, did as well as PBF, despite the fact that it's 50% uh, less costly than PBF, and did better also on immunization and insecticide treated net to use. But then for the structural quality improvement, there was improvement across board, mostly process quality. But uh, proce process quality shows limited, but then uh, structural was significantly improved across all intervention sites. So the results suggest that the middle and low, uh, low middle of the national income distribution benefiting, but not the poorest of the poor, because uh, one cannot really distinguish uh, who is poor, who is wealthy in rural Nigeria amongst, the, amongst those living there. Other key findings is that there are rooms for improvement for quantity-based indicators, I mean, uh, facilities that had poorer outcomes that baseline improved to greater degree on the endship. But then that's not the case for quality. So the focus on quality has to be improved for the project. That's one, one thing we learned. But then PBF did not improve worker motivation. And uh, this is a subtle assumption at the time of the design or concept of the project. The focus wasn't just to it wasn't overwhelmingly to motivate healthcare workers, but then the idea was that how do we get funding down to the healthcare facilities f to ensure that they're a better able to serve their communities. The, but then the influx of operating funds to facilities was also correlated with increases in ability of inputs and conducts of outreaches. So I come back again, it's the, one of the uh, overarching assumptions at the time of the concept is that uh, funds don't get to healthcare facilities. That's um, the reason why we have poor uh, indicators. Impact of airship is greatest on workers who knew about the program, but majority of health workers did not know about airship. And uh, cost effectiveness analysis, disaggregation, and ship disbursement shows that uh, PBF payments to health facilities is about uh, 42%, while DFF is 21%. And then there is high administrative and operating costs in implementing such a program in Nigeria. Uh, the total distribution of payment is in the second chart. and. Uh, greater percentage of that goes into uh, family planning and deliveries. Overall, uh, P PBF versus uh, the control for costs and quality gain is about $796, while DFF versus control is about $914. Uh, the ICR values way below Nigeria's P uh, GDP per capita, PBF and DFF overall, and also NSHIP overall, are highly cost-effective as compared to control. But then quality adjusted um, incremental cost-effectiveness of PBF compared to the control is about 300 per quality gain, while DFF is about 227. But then um, what I would like to say here, the key takeaway from the program is that NSHIPS had, um, had impacts where many other interventions have not. Uh, both PBF and DFF arms improved outcomes relative to control, but, P, but also PBF improved uh, institutional delivery. But I want to leave the stage here with two, two background. The DLIs at the state level drives motivation, both at the highest level of healthcare facility workers, but also uh, policy makers and implementers. And also the saving one million lives also has indicators that are the same as the NSHE program and it incentivizes states and states have been competing for the funds. So those could have been some of the factors that drove uh, to the results that we saw from the impact evaluation. Thank you.
Here we go. Thank you, Fajma. Uh, are there any quick uh, clarifying questions before we move on? And I should say, this is being um, live streamed, so don't ask things you don't want the internet to know about. <laughs> Yes, my question is, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. My question is, why did you include both PENTA-3 coverage and fully immunized child coverage? I would expect that those two variables would be highly correlated with each other. Yeah, I'll respond to this quickly. So I, as I mentioned, as I was about to close, I said there are other programs that incentivize uh, improvement in health outcomes. And one of the programs that defined the indicators as fully humanized children, while and SHIP uh, defined its uh, outcome of interest as a penta tree. So would, uh, for us, it's just about bringing those together because both of them are being incentivized by the bank. And so policy makers are driven to ensure that uh, they, they improve outcome, but then because we define them differently, picking just one would, would mean others may be confused, but then that's not an indicator in the other program, or it is, why isn't it being considered? But then it wasn't double counted. It, we counted one, and it's Penta 3 coverage across both programs. But because they, the indicators were defined differently at the time of des design, I, I put that there. Okay, thank you. I think we will move on. Meredith, please, uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you, welcome everyone. I'm just gonna grab a little water. Um, this is really exciting for me. Thank you so much for organizing this panel, CERN. This is um, a topic that you and I have discussed and, uh, and I have a great deal of interest. As I mentioned to Fatima um, last month, I'm teaching a class right now online, virtually, uh, uh, on um, applications of health economics to global health policy. And I wanted to have a conversation with my students just about these same kinds of issues, how we think about financial incentives in different contexts and how they might vary. And so this is a really wonderful. Thank you for helping me with my class, CERN. Um, so, uh, the, as, we were, as we were talking about organizing this session and thinking about uh, what I should present here, I wanted to present something that uh, was comparable in some ways. And um, this paper that I'm going to present today is the only randomized controlled trial that I've been involved with. And I think one, one big difference that I notice in the literature from the U.S. and the industrialized world in general is that we almost always look at natural experiments. There, there are very few randomized controlled trial of provider incentives. There are more trials of consumer incentives. Uh, and, um, and this was uh, one of my favorite projects of all time. This paper was published about three years ago. And um, my co-authors and colleagues uh, from this team uh, are, are listed here. Uh, many of you know David Ash and Kevin Volpe, who have <clears throat> put together the Center for Behavioral Economics Research and Health at the University of Pennsylvania. And they do really uh, wonderful work there. And it's such a pleasure and an honor to be able to work with this whole team. Uh, I, one of the big uh, sort of characteristics of this project is this was an incredibly resource intensive project to undertake. And, um, and the folks at Penn really uh, had this huge center um, with many minions uh, running around making all of this possible. So uh, the study that I'm gonna talk about is about incentivizing cholesterol control. Uh, cholesterol control, uh, of course, is a key input to managing cardiovascular disease. Uh, and um, cardiovascular disease kills one in six Americans today. Uh, and control with statins in particular reduces the risk of major cardiac events from heart attacks alone by 30%. But adherence to cholesterol medication is pretty poor. Approximately half of patients prescribed statins discontinue usage within a year. And so there, um, w one of the things about cholesterol control is that, of course, it requires appropriate diagnosis and prescription, but it also requires that patients maintain the use of these drugs. Um, 
And so um, thinking about the use of financial incentives for quality, um, these kinds of payment incentives have been applied in many cases in the US by commercial insurance companies as well as government payers, uh, typically to improve measures of either screening or chronic disease management when it comes to physician pay for performance. Um, to some degree, uh, but to a somewhat lesser degree in the US, payers have focused on outcomes, intermediate outcomes, like hemoglobin A1C control and cholesterol control. These outcome measures um, have been used in, in other pay for performance programs, most notably, I would say, uh, the GP contract um, in the UK. But it, in the US, the, the targeting of intermediate health outcomes remains somewhat rare primarily because we don't typically have these kinds of data available, particularly to the insurers that may be designing and implementing these pay for performance programs. So if we think about commercial health insurers in the US, uh, United, Aetna, these big private insurers, they have access to data on what services patients get, but they do not typically have access to data on outcomes. And so that's just something else to note that when I tell you a little bit about the context of this program, it's embedded within a delivery system where there's access to the health record, including information on these intermediate outcomes. Um, and to pay for performance in general in the US, particularly pay for performance programs targeting physicians has uh, been very mixed in terms of results. Um, and when I say mixed, I really mean there's just not a lot of encouraging evidence, um, e even now, on the effectiveness of pay for performance. And, um, and when it comes to these kinds of chronic disease ma management um, measures, physicians in particular have objected that patient factors are driving compliance and thereby outcomes to such a great extent that paying physicians for performance is neither fair nor effective. Um, on the other hand, of course, um, incentives to patients for a variety of health behaviors have been used um, in context both in the uh, developing world and in the industrialized world, although again, uh, to a lesser extent um, in the US, um, in particular where we see evidence of conditional cash transfers for health behavior, um, uh, uh, for addiction treatment and for sustained tuberculosis treatment, that's where patient incentives um, have a, a pretty solid evidence base in the US context. Um, more recently, and largely through the efforts of uh, Kevin Volpe and his colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, there have been some very interesting experiments looking at the use of patient incentives, particularly for smoking cessation, uh, where those incentives were shown to be successful um, in a particular design, looking at weight loss, which of course is a more complex behavior. It, uh, it requires a lot of different adaptations of behavior and a sustained behavior change. Um, the, the effects of incentives have been uh, much less um, beneficial than in the, the case of smoking cessation. So some evidence that patient incentives can work in health behavior, very little evidence around the uh, chronic disease management as well as medication adherence. Although simultaneous to this study, um, there were some other studies that went on in the US, so there's a little bit more encouraging evidence today. Big question that really motivated this trial was uh, why and how um, might shared incentives, both physician and patient incentives at the same time, aligned around the same set of measures, um, how those might facilitate improved chronic disease management. Uh, so uh, we imagine first that there may be some gains in the willingness of physicians to participate in a context where patient incentives are aligned, uh, given that physicians, when surveyed, when asked, have frequently objected to the fact that patients did not have similar incentives. Um, we were interested in whether this would facilitate communication between doctors and patients around the goals of cholesterol control, around the challenges that patients may be having in taking statins in, in controlling their cholesterol, um, and that somehow there might be a, a synergy between the physician and patient incentives. 
So the trial targeted patients who had physicians, primary care physicians at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Group, the Geisinger Health System Medical Group, uh, and Vanguard Medical Associates in Boston. Uh, patients were enrolled in the trial were essentially high-risk patients. These were patients who were at 20% risk of an adverse event based on the Framingham risk score uh, with a cholesterol level greater than 120 or somewhat lower level risk, Framingham risk score with a higher cholesterol level uh, above 140. Um, the physicians were randomized to a 12-month trial. So the physicians were, were essentially enrolled. The groups all agreed to the to the trial, physicians had to be recruited, and physicians were recruited on the basis of having at least five patients who were deemed to be eligible. Um, there were three arms, the physician incentive alone, patient incentive alone, and the shared incentives. And, and part of the trial involved uh, a pill bottle that would automatically register when the patient opened the bottle as a way of passively measuring medication adherence. These are the so-called glow caps. Um, and then uh, quarterly, patients had their cholesterol tested. So just to pull out a little bit more of that context, uh, as I think this will be part of our discussion, these practices are all, <clears throat> excuse me, all roughly in the Northeastern United States. Uh, the three practices are all connected to the affiliated uh, researchers. So these are all academic practices in some way. Um, they train primary care uh, 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 students. And uh, the groups are relatively within the U.S. context. There are large organized systems that have a fair amount of human capital, a pretty sophisticated infrastructure, including electronic health records. Uh, so these are systems with relatively high capacity for quality management and quality improvement. Um, the patients recruited, you'll see a few demographics, but generally these patients um, have few individuals from uh, minority populations in the U.S. Only about 3% of the patients were black or Hispanic, and the patient incomes are, are a bit above average. There's, there is a distribution, but these patients on average are a bit higher income than Americans as a whole. There were two urban sites, and then the one at, at Geisinger Health Systems is in rural Pennsylvania. So the first arm, patient incentives. Each patient was assigned a quarterly goal based on their baseline cholesterol and Framingham risk score um, to either maintain cholesterol below 100, uh, the guideline level of cholesterol control, or to reduce their cholesterol by at least 10 milligrams per deciliter. Every day that the patients took their medication, measured by that automatic pill cap, um, they were entered into a lottery where they had a one in 100 chance of winning $100 and a one in 18 chance of winning $10. So the annual expected value um, for the patient, if they took their medication every day, was $1,024. The lottery earnings accrued quarterly and they were only paid out if the patient met their qu quarterly goal. So there was both sort of instant feedback um, and reinforcement, the use of lotteries, um, as well as um, the um, potential to leverage loss aversion because patients would see how much they had accrued but would only get that money if their cholesterol was controlled. So the physician and shared incentives are structured as follows. The physician incentive arm also had quarterly feedback and payments for meeting patient goals, uh, $256 per quarter per patient or $1,000 per year. The payment in um, this context relative to typical pay for performance programs in the US was more frequent, so quarterly versus typically pay for performance programs reward physicians on an annual basis. Um, and it was highlighted by having a separate check rather than having the money just flow into the physician's direct deposit. And then the shared incentive arm is essentially 50% uh, on the patient side and 50% on the physician side. So those incentives are, are cut in half for each, but they add up to the same amount. 
So for each of the arms, the, the upside was essentially $1,024 per patient. Um, this is a, a pretty large incentive compared to similar pay-for-performance programs in the U.S. Um, while it, it's not a big percentage of the physician's income, if a physician did have, let's say, five patients that were ultimately enrolled in the trial, this is a substantial amount of money. And so I'm sorry the labels didn't come out on this chart. I realized that this morning, but too late to do anything about it. So we want to guess, so this is uh, cholesterol control levels, uh, and, um, and so we have a baseline uh, to 15 months, uh, so the trial extended 12 months, and then there was a three-month post-trial period of observation, uh, and cholesterol levels on the y-axis. Um, so uh, who thinks the blue line is patient incentives? No. You read the paper. Okay, forget it. Um, uh, the shared incentive line is the blue line. The physician incentive line is the green line. Um, and then the um, uh, patient incentives um, are the red line and control yellow line. Um, so you can see, uh, first of all, that all groups regress, um, all groups improve, uh, but the uh, shared incentive group improves by more, and I'll um, mention later that that is a statistically significant difference. Again, these, these patients were recruited as ha at having a very high uh, cholesterol level, so there's a certain amount of regression to the mean uh, that's happening with all the groups. And then medication adherence here, uh, higher is better. Uh, blue line, again, is the combined incentives, red line, patient incentives, green line, physician incentives, uh, and yellow line, control. Um, and one of the things that, that you might notice is that no one's doing that great. Uh, <laughs> these lines are all below 50%. Um, so uh, this has not solved the statin adherence problem, uh, but, um, but again, the shared incentives uh, do the best here. Uh, patients in the shared incentive arm achieve the largest reductions in cholesterol, followed by physician only, control, and patient only. Only patients in the shared incentive arm achieved a statistically significant reduction. Um, at 12 months, um, a, a little less than half of patients in the shared incentive arm had achieved their LDL goal compared to 40% in the physician only, 40% in the patient only, and 36% in the control. Um, and at 15 months, uh, so this is after the three-month waiting period, after the incentives had stopped, the cholesterol values uh, were virtually the same. So uh, we did have a qualitative arm of the study, um, and in patient interviews, uh, patients expressed um, a, a genuine desire to improve their health that motivated their enrollment uh, and, uh, and found the feedback from the frequent testing as well as the glow, glow caps usual, um, useful. Uh, both patients and physicians downplayed the role of financial incentives, so of course it, it's a little hard to know what to make of that. Um, but uh, one of the things we were interested in learning is whether having the shared incentives meant that doctors and patients would talk about uh, cholesterol control and their shared goals, and um, what we learned from these interviews is not so much. Um, and uh, in general, there was evidence of ambivalence around medication use. And, and that is likely what is driving the low adherence. Um, there are side effects, uh, and also people generally prefer to, at least in theory, uh, to adopt behavioral uh, changes, diet, exercise versus medication. So it does seem that these incentives, which really tried to um, use the insights from the literature to design uh, both the implementation um, and the combination of physician and patient incentives uh, using the best information, uh, these kinds of incentives can make a difference. Uh, and perhaps uh, in other chronic illnesses, shared incentives also make sense. A related cost-effectiveness analysis uh, by my colleague Ankur Pandia, um, which was published just last year, showed that um, the, pay for, the shared 
pay for performance incentives was cost effective. Under most scenarios, of course, that depends a lot on how long the cholesterol control benefits actually last, and the trial only really looked three months after the incentive payments had stopped, so um, a certain amount of speculation is required there. Uh, we didn't have the power to really determine which pa patients benefited from the trial more than others, so that's an area of interest for larger population-based studies. Uh, not surprisingly, patients with the highest cholesterol at baseline were uh, more likely to show improvements, and high-risk patients in general were more likely to show improvements. So I look forward to the discussion. I don't know if there are any, um, any clarifying questions, or we'll move on to Peter. I'm curious what you think the mechanism was for the increased uh, reductions from the shared savings, given that patients were saying that they weren't yeah. really discussing it. Well, so uh, it's a really good question. And again, the interviews were designed to try to get at that. It's not entirely clear, but I think one, um, uh, there are two distinct possibilities. One is that it's simply about escalating dosage. Uh, even if adherence didn't increase, there might have been medication changes that helped bring some patients into control, uh, conditional on the level of adherence. But, uh, but uh, you know, obviously, one that's totally unrelated to medication would be increased advice that was then taken around diet and exercise. So those seem to be the two possibilities. This is a tough room. Uh, applause for the microphone. <laughs> I, I, I would love to see the actual data, but this seems to be telling me exactly what you just said, that the improvements and sustaining results have not related to the lack of adherence to statins. So I know it's not for you, what you're publishing, but that's actually good evidence as to the fact that statins may not be necessarily that efficacious, uh, and it may be many <laughs> other things which is, um, again, not related to the incentives you were trying to create, but it's, it's startling. Yeah, I'm just an economist, but, um, but I think, I think that's, it's a really interesting proposition. I, I think also if you uh, take sort of revealed preference from this, uh, there's very little that is going to really change people's adherence to statins. And I, I know, uh, you know from uh, managing parents in this um, high cholesterol group that uh, statins are, are not easy for a lot of people to take. So it's very, it is very interesting that improvements were still possible. That seems to be it. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite uh, Peter Smith to come and give uh, some reflections on this, and then I think we, we will slide into a discussion amongst all of you. So if you start to have questions or things you want to raise, please take some notes, and maybe I can invite you to slide over to those uh, chairs so people can see you. But <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much uh, to Soren and the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, I, I'm a bit of a, a fraud, really, to be here, because um, uh, I've never worked on uh, explicitly on a pay for performance uh, evaluation or design. Um, so I'm just an observer. And, and before I started, I start, perhaps I ought to pay tribute to the both the uh, health service administrators and to the, um, for implementing these very complex schemes and also to the researchers for their heroic efforts to evaluate them because um, I think these are really uh, potentially very complex. So um, I'm, I'm just going to talk for um, uh, less than 10 minutes just to set a context and to sort of stimulate a few questions. Um, so, uh, the first thing I want to do is just to highlight a, um, a report on high-income countries, or high-ish country, income countries, that was prepared by the European Observatory and the OECD. Um, and uh, this looked at supply-side pay-for-performance only, so incentivizing providers. Now, 
The interesting thing is, uh, I mean, first of all, it reflected the usual findings in this area, that the results are not very startling at best. And actually, for many schemes, it was difficult to find any effect on the targeted, um, the targeted uh, dimensions. However, um, all of the schemes reported some general benefits, and I think both Fatima and uh, Meredith... Oh, have they left already? <laughs> Good. I'm relieved about that. <laughs> um, so uh, they both raised these issues that actually the scheme has these side benefits. And, and this is a general finding. For example, clarification of goals of providers, improving, improved processes for purchasing health services, um, improved measurement of provider activity and performance. Uh, there became a, a, a better dialogue between purchasers and providers, and there was improved accountability and governance of the health system generally. And I think we can, we can pretty surely say that these schemes do have these important, really important health system benefits, um, which ultimately can perhaps be summarised in improving the strategic purchasing of health services. Um, so what are the key messages that are coming through um, from that sort of work and from low-income work? Um, I, I, for the low-income research, I refer to a, um, a survey uh, done by the World Bank um, by uh, Mag uh, Magnus Lindelow and uh, I think it was Adam Wagstaff. Uh, and again, you know, the, the results are very, very similar in many ways. Um, now, they actually found demand-side incentives were stronger than supply-side. This is a, a review of low-income settings. Now, um, this, this may be a fundamental difference, that there's more to be done on the demand-side in low-income settings than there is in high-income settings. So, you know, maybe that's something Meredith can... Uh, well, both of you can perhaps um, comment on uh, later on. Um, uh, the, there is some impact on processes tends to be strongest in ambulatory settings, um, and there's, no one's been really able to establish much impact on health outcomes. Um, it seems that the actual size of the rewards, generally speaking, isn't particularly important the uh, uh, in um, affecting outcomes. Um, one of the findings um, that from both high and low income settings is that... Uh, Providers do need some assurance that the program is going to be long-lasting because very often these involve investment of some sort in new systems or new human resources. Um, and so th there does seem uh, to be uh, some requirement that they have that reassurance. And of course here is where particularly low-income countries have a real problem because many of the schemes that have been tried in low-income settings are funded by external donors, um, and we all know the stories about how the external donors have their pet projects, they go in, they disrupt the system, and then when they leave, how does the system react and respond and integrate that um, initiative into their general working of the health system? Um, I might also more generally say, I've been struck in the limited amount of work I've done in low-income settings, I've been struck by the huge complexity of the financing arrangements when you have all these different donors and providers and NGOs in a country, maybe all with different reporting mechanisms, uh, different governance requirements. Um, uh, there seems to be um, a fairly strong feeling that you should really target, with these paid for performance schemes, target the things you really want to change. Don't try and... Um, uh, look at the whole system and everything uh, in, uh, uh, that you want to um, have high quality, high outcomes. Target the things where you really want change. Um, and the other thing that is lacking in most of the schemes uh, that we looked at, I mean, it's an exhausting process administratively, bureaucratically, to put these schemes in place. Um, but then you, you say, okay, they've got this scheme in place. Is it working? Does it need... Uh, adjusting, um, have 
some of the indicators, have they had perverse outcomes and we need to adjust them? Have they become redundant? Should we be changing the schedule of rewards and so on? And it's that review process that seems to be very hard to mobilize. Um, so the schemes can be quickly become out of date and ossified. So, um, my, my last slide is about um, some of the common challenges to these schemes. Um, there are design challenges. What to reward, how to measure um, progress, uh, how to reward it, the, the, the schedule of um, rewards, um, and how do you uh, adjust for the fact that um, it's easier to achieve results in some areas of the, or, or some contexts than others in your scheme. Um, now, I think this is a matter for discussion. It may be something you want to raise, is whether some of these issues are more critical and important in uh, low- and middle-income settings than in high-income and vice versa. Um, and um, uh, I, I would point particularly, for example, to the... Uh, the manpower constraints, the human resource constraints that exist in low-income settings and whether that has a distinct impact on how these schemes can work. Secondly, evaluation. Um, another common challenge. Uh, of course, we want to evaluate the intended effects, but actually, in many respects, it's the unintended consequences um, that are of most concern in, in these schemes. Are there, do we have positive spillovers, like the sort of governance improvements I mentioned? Do we have negative spillovers, like a neglect of aspects of the health system that are not being rewarded? So, you know, uh, and um, uh, actually I was really pleased in both the presentations to see mention of cost effectiveness, because in the, uh, you know, if you throw enough money at it, I imagine you would eventually get an effect. The question is, is that money being well spent? Uh, and uh, so, of course, like all interventions in the health system, in principle, these ought to be submit, uh, subjected to cost-effectiveness analysis. Um, and how do we, uh, again, the contextual factors. Um, finally, on governance, um, there are big challenges um, on uh, uh, auditing, validating, and just putting in place procedures for information collection uh, with these schemes. Um, there are issues about um, accountability, large amounts of money may be at stake, and so um, it's not only that the payer wants to be assured that the money is being spent as intended, but actually that's got to be, be reassured across the whole system because all providers or all can, um, uh, service users have to be assured that there isn't uh, corruption or, um, uh, and so on in the system. And once again, this issue um, of reviewing and updating the program, is it easier or more complex in, in low and middle income compared to high settings? And you know, that again is something uh, that we can discuss. So, um, uh, lots and lots of questions. Uh, what we're looking for from you, actually, is answers, not questions. <laughs> so, um, you know, can, can the two, um, if you like, the two cultures, uh, with these common challenges, can they learn from each other? Can more be learned? Um, and uh, are, there, are there aspects, are we missing uh, tricks in, uh, in designing, in evaluating, and the governance of these schemes uh, that we haven't so far uh, taken advantage of. Um, so with that, um, I, I throw it open to the floor. Um, our very fit uh, uh, colleague will be running up and down. <laughs> well, Getting should be by fit, the fit by the end of the day anyway. So. <laughs> no need for statins there. Okay, okay so should we, should we start? And um, I, I'll take a view as to whether to collect... Or, or just direct them straight, you straight to you. So, where are we? It's also got better eyesight than me, as well as being a lot fitter than me. So. Can you um, give your... Uh, just give yes. your name when you... Uh, um, yes. 
Thanks. You, you all look like ants from up here. So, <laughs> uh, this, uh, I'm Joe Cutson from uh, World Health Organization. Peter, I wanted to come back to one of, one of your points. I think it was on the previous slide where you said that the actual size of the rewards is not important and is measurement and publication sufficient. I think this is a really important issue, especially for th thinking about how the analysis of pay for performance or performance-based funding, whatever we call it, has been done in low and middle income countries. And I think an important distinction with the work done in OECD is an explicit attention in the higher income countries, an explicit attention to treating the performance element, and I'm talking specifically on the supply side type of arrangement, treating the performance element as one part of the payment system and thinking, you know, in terms of that you actually don't need a large, and, and most of the countries, probably with the exception of the UK, have a, a fairly small performance element and looking at the fact that, you know, economics may work and it may be incentives at the margin that matter and the size, as you're saying, is not that important. And also then using that what we're trying to get is not just performance, but actually using that to leverage getting data. And as you're saying, if you actually get the data on uh, how providers are behaving, what's happening with patients, just that itself by providing, doing the right type of analysis, providing feedback, identifying outliers, that may be more important as a mechanism than actually the financial incentive. So this idea of kind of shifting, and maybe this is more of a plea, in a way to sh for those working in low and middle income countries in particular to explicitly embed the pay for performance in the wider payment system and that the analysis is of the combination and not just the pay for performance. We have many cases in low and middle income countries where the base payment system is not functioning very well, right? So if salaries are delayed by several months, they're not flowing, not being paid on time, and then you come in with a large pay for performance, is it actually the incentives or the fact that more money is now flowing, right? And in a way, we're not necessarily paying attention to the real problem, which may be to fix how salaries are being paid and getting that out on time. So it would be, I think one of the, anyway, this is not a question, it's more I said a plea, is, is to really kind of shift how we do that analysis of pay for performance in low and middle low and middle income countries to embed it in that wider approach and wider thinking. So Joe, just before you let go of the microphone, do, does that imply that um, the, the external agencies, if they're funding this sort of thing, they should pay a lot more attention to integrating whatever they're doing uh, into the routine, um, uh, routine payment system in the country? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. One is that integration. The other is being really careful about starting with large um, bonuses, in a sense, because you know it's hard to go down if you start large, yeah. right? And it may be, I think the evidence is showing that it may be that the small or sometimes nothing other than information and feedback may be the kind of doing no harm approach and then seeing if you can Augment. I was thinking of, of when, I, when we did some analysis a number of years ago on the uh, health extension worker program in Ethiopia, one of the striking things there is that the reform involved making them all salaried civil servants, giving them clear job descriptions and paying their salaries on time and holding them accountable, right? And, so, and that seemed to work, apparently. So, you know, being sure that we take care of the basics and not be overly fascinated with our own... Uh, innovations, I think, is an important part of that. Sure. Thanks. Would either of um, our speak? would you like to say something about that, uh, Fatima? Is, was there a, uh, I mean, was that a particular issue in the Nigerian uh, experiment? Um, and I would like to relate to what you just stated. Uh, some of these factors are clear and apparent in Nigeria. Healthcare workers, even if they are paid on time, are not paid the basic minimum wage. That's one thing, and I, I believe this intervention cannot correct that fact. So really integrating it into the own system where the bonuses would be attached to their salaries and the payroll of the government may help improve 
uh, situation, but also perhaps that would motivate the government to ensure that healthcare workers are paid adequately what they are, uh, what they ought to be paid as against uh, the, the lower level of salary that they're receiving. Secondly, is that uh, yes, I would agree with you, there are unintended consequences that should be factored in, that should be looked or should be acknowledged as a result of such interventions. Um, for example, maybe now the fact that uh, health facilities look physically, structurally better, that has motivated people to go demand for service. But that's not captured in the design of the evaluation. And so I believe such factors could actually, should actually be um, uh, recognized. And also the third thing is that uh, reforms, especially in low and middle income countries, I believe the assumption, say, for example, for the, the PBF is that, yes, it is well designed and so it should we should see positive impacts within three or four years. But the systems are different. We don't have institutions that hold people as um, accountable for what they are responsible for. Neither is there an enforcing agency where as soon as you introduce a new policy or reform, that everybody has to take the march in order and do as is dictated in the new reform. Others may fall back and then there is no negative incentive. They don't do it and they don't get uh, punished or they don't, nobody would actually sue anyone for not going to work or providing substandard services, which is not the case in developed countries or developed settings. So I believe several, con sev uh, several of these factors and contexts should actually be taken into consideration in such interve interventions. Okay, thank you. We got some uh, other interventions. Uh, yep, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Trifin Zulu. I work for a government medical scheme uh, in South Africa that covers civil servants. So I wanted to share my experience, but also ask a question in terms of how or, or why you've excluded uh, the poor people, the poor quintiles in the study that you shared with us um, to the second presenter. Could you speak up just a little bit, please? Oh, sorry. Is it better now? Is it better now? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Trifin Zulu. I work for a, a, a scheme in South Africa that covers civil servants. Uh, so I wanted to share my experience and also ask question, uh, one question in relation to why you chose to exclude a large proportion of the poor people in your study for the second presenter. Because we find that uh, the outcomes for the poor tend to be um, relatively poor relative, uh, when you compare to the wealthier um, um, uh, respondents. So in the South African setting, we've got a scheme that um, in our, you know, it's called the GEMS, uh, the scheme that I work for. So we reward uh, family practitioners for doing certain tests for chronic conditions. For instance, your HbA1c for diabetes. But then what we find is that even though we incentivize them, we pay them more for doing those tests, the uptake has not been that great. Uh, so maybe it's because we compare, for you to get a, a payment or a reward, you, we compare you to, the, to your peers, your best performing peers. So we don't set a standard to say, please reach maybe 80%, but it's relative to how your peers are performing. But because the peers are also performing at a very low uh, level, we have not been able to increase that. Do you have any suggestions as to how we could uh, potentially improve uptake? Do you set a target and say everybody should move towards that target? Or do we still stay with the same approach that says, how are you performing relative to your peers? Because obviously the contextual factors are similar. Okay, so basically the question there is, what, how you know you want to incentivize something, but is the question, what is the best way of incentivizing that? Is it some absolute target? Um, uh, actually, another option would be uh, percentage improvement, or, uh, uh, and another one is relative to your, uh, your comparators. So, um, and, you know, th this is a, a major issue across uh, any one of these schemes, I, I imagine. Do, do either of our speakers have anything to to say on this um, on this? Meredith, would you like to? 
Sure. I, I mean, I think this is a, a common challenge in the design of pay for performance schemes, and uh, different approaches have been taken. I think there there, are, there can be measurement challenges in, uh, strictly speaking, rewarding improvement, just because, especially with hemoglobin A1C, there's a lot of noise, right? So, um, so I think that's that's generally you saw in um, in the trial that we worked on. They were looking at fixed. Uh, this was on the patient side, but you could imagine something similar on the physician side: fixed increments of improvement. So, a, a 10 milligram per deciliter improvement in your cholesterol means you've done better. Uh, I think that's a little bit easier than um, than trying to measure some percentage improvement improvement from all different levels. Um, but I think there, there's, no, there's no absolute right answer. It does, um, when you have a very low baseline level of performance, uh, it, it certainly doesn't make sense to you know, set a very high target because then it's not, it's not a very good incentive scheme. Um, so you want to have people have the capacity to gradually improve and get rewards along the way. Uh, a, a number of schemes have chosen to compare um, physicians or hospitals to their peers. Uh, and while that has the advantages of filtering out common shocks, I, I, my experience personally is that providers uh, tend to view that with a lot of suspicion. Uh, and um, they, they, when given the choice, uh, opt away from those uh, comparative systems and prefer absolute performance measures. Sure. Presumably there, there's potentially a big impact on patient recruitment and patient selection. Right. Um, so that would be, the, of course, the, the big concern, especially if you have a high target um, initially. And, and so that's without big... adjustment for patient severity or right. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, Right, so I'm going <laughs> to... I have the microphone. going to take pity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta, uh, so there was someone a um, bit higher up. Where's, where's the mic gone? <laughs> well, oh, oh, right. <laughs> oh, so now it's hurdles as well as uh, steps. Uh, at the end of that road. But she was... <laughs> Can you put your hand up, please? So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I will try to be very brief. I'm Marcos Vera from University College London. Uh, I wonder the, the panel's view on crowding out of intrinsic motivation. That's one of the reasons given by why like, incentives might not have the desired effects. Um, my intuition is that they might be quite different in high-income and low-income settings. In high-income settings, maybe doctors sort of have a very a more strong view that the incentives undermine their professional uh, views or professional, and, and so they seen as more undermining, while maybe in low income settings, the income effect, given that we tend to think probably minor utility of income will be quite higher in low income settings, then that, that, the, the, increasing, the crowding out of intrinsic motivation might be much smaller. But. Okay, so that, that's an interesting observation. Can we just store Store up these, and I'll come back because we got three questions. To, rip, rip. Um, go on then. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, <coughs> Pia Schneider, World Bank. Um, I have three points. I think on the evaluations, we need to do a better job on identifying what is actually the intervention, because very often we see in, in, in evaluations that there is more than one intervention. Like, for, if I understood correctly here, we have the financial incentive, and then we have a budget increase, plus we have increased autonomy to providers, and that's not the same uh, in the control or in the DFF. So, we, at the end of the day, we don't really know, because, uh, because there is no marginal analysis, what, what actually drove the effect of those three. That's the first, sorry. <laughs> and then the second point I wanted to make is, I think it's a very interesting finding that you had also in Nigeria on uh, that the rich benefited more than the poor. 
uh, because there was, I remember there was a paper from the UK where they also found that providers in higher income areas did perform better uh, with regards to P4P compared to those in lower income areas. And so the question then arises is also, is it easier to treat um, richer patients to follow up or is it driven by the design that those facilities that did better were in areas that, that, that were had a higher socioeconomic context. And the third point I wanted to make is also in response to Joe's um, parallel, parallel comment. It's just very difficult to convince governments that they have to change the chart of accounts because it's a PFM question at the end of the day if we want to integrate that. And if we can't do that, then I think the only solution is actually to go through some existing purchaser like a, a social health insurer who would have a fee-for-service system already in place. And, and that would make it more um, easier to implement. But chart of account change is always difficult. Okay, so uh, actually there are quite a lot of points there. So can <laughs> I um, perhaps uh, um, leave both of you to intervene if you want to, uh, uh, to respond? Do you want to start? Okay, I'll, I'll try to respond to two of your points. Yes, I agree that um, uh, evaluations should, should be designed in such a way that... Um, Factors such as autonomy are measured, and it should be measured closely. Uh, what I would say about that is that um, in both instances, both PBF and DFF facility managers had autonomy to 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 run the health facilities. But the most interesting for me, in my personal opinion, is that this is a situation where healthcare workers have been working for decades, 15 to 20 years, without ever receiving the adequate um, operational funds to provide care to the community. And then with the DFF, facility managers see monthly, uh, quarterly subsidies paid into their account. They're able to go and buy the drugs that the community needs based on what the it's recurrent and they get to pay for ad hoc staff so they get to improve the general env uh, environment, cleanliness and hygiene and what have you. And I have said this to my colleagues, I said that is enough incentive and motivation to, to drive me to, me to earn results, but then those are not captured in the IE design and I agree with you. On the wealthier consumers, and I mean, they're not outside of the bottom four quintile, but then within the bottom four quintile, you have others doing better than others, and that's what we're trying to capture. And I believe that the increase in demand or uptake of service in this cohort, it could perhaps be that they're more informed, better educated compared to the others, so they have information that they use to make decision that would, wouldn't have which is not, which is otherwise in the other uh, women still within the uh, fourth quintile, but then they don't know how to translate information to 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 make decisions. So I believe those those are the driving factors. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I, I guess maybe I'll um, try to tackle the intrinsic motivation question, uh, which I think is a really interesting question. I, I don't know the answer to it, and um, I know a number of colleagues have tried to tease out uh, the intrinsic motivation from extrinsic motivation, largely in laboratory settings. Um, so I, I think the, the last IHEA, maybe in Boston, we had some interesting talks on this subject. It, it remains, I think, um, a lot more theory than empirical evidence. Um, it, it is interesting, you know, again, the context of the work that we did, um, physicians are well compensated. And now they're, they're primary care physicians who in the US, US feel that they are not well compensated because they compare themselves to specialists who make a lot more. Um, nonetheless, they, they are well compensated for their time. And we did have quite a lot of uh, trouble enrolling physicians in the trial, which may t tell you a, something about how they feel about these kinds of incentives. And, um, and that you know, may have to do with the the administrative burden of participation, but I do think it has something to do with their sense that financial incentives are something that um, uh, are somewhat counter to their 
their professional ideals. Uh, I think those physicians who enrolled saw the opportunity for their patients to have more support, so for other caregivers uh, to be interacting with patients with the glow caps, with the quarterly testing, that's something they didn't have to do that could potentially improve the health of their patients. But I think it remains interesting to, to ask this question, especially in the, in the different settings. Um, so in and, and terms of unpacking these interventions to learn more about the value of each component, I think that will always be a challenge. Of course, these, even the randomized control trial that we did, which is really purely an academic exercise, to, it is, there was no payer. Um, the payer uh, was uh, the, the federal research agency uh, that put $20 million into this grant. Uh, and um, so even there, you know, we could not really have pitched something even to the IRB that didn't have all the pieces that we thought were necessary to make it successful. The, you know, the, the support system, so not just the financial incentive. So I think there's always going to be a tension between wanting to do something that has a likelihood of working and therefore has multiple elements and not necessarily being able to figure out exactly which of those active ingredients is most important. Thanks, thanks, Merida. Yes, there's a bit of a paradox, isn't there? I mean, the medical profession, uh, there is this very strong view that um, money should have no role in incentivizing what yes. they do, and yet they're amongst the strongest trade unions in their countries, you know, so. Okay, um, Tony. Hi, I'm Tony Scott, the University of Melbourne. Um, I guess a couple of things. One is just to go back to an earlier point about the size of incentives. We're, we're updating a systematic review of ours where you've got a graph of the, of the proportion of positive outcomes across studies and the size of the incentives is the proportion of revenue and it's pretty flat. And we've just added another 20 source studies and it's, it's actually can't go negative. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's one issue. And, and, I'm, and I'm wondering then, is it just the fact that providers just need a pat on the back of some kind? And a bit of money is that, but also there's feedback of performance and the things that, that matter as well. So that's one thing. Um, another thing, I guess, in terms of the difference between these settings, is it, is it, I mean, and there's not much evidence, I guess, whether schemes are, are more effective in, in low and middle income country settings and high country settings, but is, 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 is the view that um, in high income countries, we're at the flat of the curve for a lot of these conditions anyway. And because we're at the lower part of the curve for these lower middle income countries, that, that they're going to have more impact. I don't think anybody's directly compared the outcomes because mm. it's hard, but you know, and whether there, there's any view about that. Okay, thank you. There's someone um, towards the back there. Just to add, Jim uh, Guest from Research Institute in United Economics, Paris. Just to add a bit of complexity regarding the target, I think the target is not only so the target is behavior, of course. So I like the idea to to trying to align the target of the physician and the patient, and maybe also to to align the target of the physician within a primary care team. So there is also a question about how to target uh, because most of the of the levers you could have, it's, it's the lever of one physician within a practice, but it's also the levers of involving other kind of healthcare personnel in the practice regarding the behavior of the patient and the behavior and what could the practice could do for the patient in much more large extent. So I think it's add a bit of complexity regarding how to design the incentive in order to take into account of this kind of uh, uh, way to practice. Yeah, thank you. The lady behind, um, I think, were you? No, no, she's, uh, so, yeah, the gentleman to the, the right there, then. <laughs> um, my name is Sasir Sarma. I'm from Western University, Canada. So a general question to the panel is, is there any evidence on the long-run effects of these financial incentives? Because I think most of the evidence is just the okay, incentives kick in. There's a high degree of motivations for the providers or the stakeholders, and you see some you know, in case in the positive facts, or maybe six months or one year, but the how these effects are sustainable, um, any evidence around these long-run effects, that would be very useful. Uh, especially, I don't know how the cost effectiveness <coughs> analysis generated, but we need these long-run effects, um, or it just dies out over time. You know, yeah. That's something, uh, how much evidence out there would be useful. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So, some, um, 
pretty fundamental questions here. Who, who should you target? Um, uh, um, what about the long run? Uh, and, and Tony's points there. So um, maybe if I could just give both of you just two minutes uh, just to wrap up and any more general points you wanted to. So um, could I start with you, Fatima? Target. I believe in low-income countries, targeting is not an easy tax to, to achieve. I mean, if, if, if you're going to be specific about who to target at the community or the client side, then it, it would require you to invest in community-based targeting that would actually, is actually resource-intensive. That's one, but then if you were to target the healthcare providers, I mean, as is the, the case in the NSHIP program, I feel there's room for improvement where uh, the incentives should, should be tied to each, each and every healthcare worker. It, should, it shouldn't be such that uh, at a quarterly, there has to be meetings where there's decision about how those incentives would be shared. But then, are these the, the right uh, reforms to introduce? I, I, I feel it should be complementary to other system, system correcting reforms that should be in place. But I don't feel that uh, there is a one answer that fits all in this case. Um, secondly, I would like to say that I, I haven't seen uh, uh, evidence of uh, the long-term impact of these um, financial incentive schemes, not not in the settings that I've worked on. But uh, one thing I would like to bring out is uh, experience in South Sudan where uh, such schemes were introduced and now donors and partners and all all of us are scrambling around, running to have the government pay the healthcare workers from their uh, payroll, and then the government's response is, we cannot afford to pay them at the rate at which you have been incentivizing them. So where do they go? And um, donors can't be there, they cannot replace government, so they're looking at where's the end for us? When should we step back But then? The government is saying, I don't think I can step it in right now with, uh, in, in this context. So, okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, well, I think I'd like to talk most about the, the long-term nature of, uh, of these incentives. And I, I remember when I first started working in pay for performance, the payers that I would talk to. So these are largely large commercial insurers and their medical directors. They would say, well, for how long do we have to offer these incentives before the behavior is ingrained? Um, and aren't we already paying for performance? And so, so to some extent, I think the uh, payers in the US have looked at these incentives as sort of transitional. Uh, but, you know, obviously from an economic perspective, you can think about pay for performance as simply shifting the basis for payment and, and worrying about what the marginal payment is actually for, and that could be ongoing. Uh, I, I think um, pay for performance programs uh, have not really had that long-term view to the extent that we have pay for performance programs that have been in place uh, for long periods of time in the US. Um, these are largely the hospital pay for performance programs. And, and generally speaking, it seems like um, their, their incremental effects were modest to begin with and they have attenuated. Uh, and so the ability to sustain, I think especially in a complex pay for performance program where you have a lot of measures, and I, Tim Doran's here, I, I'm curious what you think about in the context of the GP contract of the COAF, that obviously you have to think about rotating measures over time and then what effect that has of pulling measures out. Um, I, this this long-term question, is a, it's a really important one. And and again, the, the RCT that I talked about today is very much an academic study. It's not picked up as an ongoing scheme despite the fact that analysis suggests it could be cost-effective to do so, which, of course, 
uh, cost effectiveness is not consistent necessarily with the health system goals, uh, that that's sort of the benevolent social planner and that person doesn't run the University of Pennsylvania Medical Group as far as I can tell. Uh, and so it's, it's not clear that we'll see these programs, even when they're effective, being maintained, um, much less effective over time. And so trying to think about what is the end game of yeah. all of these performance games, it's, it's a, a great, great question and an important thing for people to start thinking about. Yeah. I mean, I ought to mention the British, sorry to keep you, but, you know, that I, I think this is a fundamental point. The, the British uh, general practitioner scheme, yeah. which is being abandoned in some areas. Um, and so the, uh, the data is both uh, in some circumstances not being collected anymore, and in others it's become unreliable. And, you know, so that really rich resource, which is being used for fundamental reasons other than rewarding uh, providers is disappearing and you know this is a serious problem so um, uh, in conclusion I had a list of five questions I was going to ask in case our audience was quiet but you asked all of them so uh, but sadly we didn't have too many answers but um, uh, thank you all for your contributions but most of all uh, thank you to Sarum for organizing this and to our two speakers to Fatima and to Meredith for their really interesting presentations. So thank you all.